This is the 2023 rear wheel drive Tesla Model 3. Not only is it the cheapest Tesla that you could order off Tesla's website right now, it kind of already is and definitely will be one of the most popular vehicles in the world as we know it. And if you've been following the channel, you all know that I put in the order for the Space Model 3 in mid-January of this year, almost on a whim following the unexpected and frankly surprising price drops from Tesla. It took me just two weeks from the day I submitted my order to taking delivery of this car, which was a lot faster than I anticipated. I made a video talking about the entire process and about getting the full $7,500 EV tax credit, which was a big deal for me. So if you're interested in that video, I'll leave a link to it in the description. But today I finally want to talk about the car itself as I've now driven the Model 3 for about a month now. And man, I gotta be honest, I haven't been this enthused about a thing I've reviewed since getting my hands on my first iPhone. Now, mind you, I am a tech reviewer by trade, so my domain knowledge on cars is limited to say the least, so apologies in advance if you don't hear me going into specific details about things like the drag coefficient or things like that. Much like all my reviews, I am coming at you with the average Joe perspective about this car, not as an expert on automotive. Okay, when talking about the design of the 2023 Tesla Model 3, there's really not much I can say that you probably don't know already. And the main reason for that is that although this is the newest model available today, it follows the same design blueprint the Model 3 has had since its debut in 2016. So you still get that Porsche-esque front with these sporty curves and the bulbous headlight lamps. It does have a bit of a shorter nose overall, so much so that you virtually don't even see the front of the vehicle when driving. It's like a true driving point of view of the road, but the front integrates well into the sides that still maintains these nice lines across the door panels to continue with that sporty aesthetic. From there you get to the rear of the Model 3 that is known for its relatively aggressive taper that ultimately culminates with a pretty basic looking pair of taillights. The 2023 Model 3 does have the chrome deleted finish which does make for a much cleaner look in my opinion and I did configure my car with the 19 inch sport wheels. I personally think that this small upgrade goes a long way in terms of making the Model 3 look like a premium vehicle. It does come at the cost of a little range but I think it's way worth it when it comes to overall aesthetics. It should also be noted that the base standard range Model 3 does not come with fog lights. I personally don't mind at all, but that's one of the small omissions associated with going with the cheapest configuration. Now, if you've been following my Tesla purchasing journey, you all know that when I first decided to get one, I kept going back and forth between the Model 3 and the Model Y. The Model Y was not only more practical in my opinion when it came to available space, it was also way more of a deal at the time when Tesla aggressively dropped the prices. But one month later, I'm so glad I stuck with my instincts and went with the Model 3 as I think it looks so much nicer. I know this car gets a lot of criticism for looking basic, which has only gotten worse given now the ubiquity of the Model 3 out in the field. And I would agree in saying that it's not the flashiest EV out there by any means, but to be honest, that's one of the main reasons I like it so much. I feel the Model 3 is very well balanced as it has the design fundamentals of a modern sedan with just enough added elements to make it somewhat sporty and unique. And though it may come off a bit bland, what it gives you in return is a look that will last a long time, and I feel as though the Model 3 has proven that. There seems to be a trend with EVs that they have to have these ostentatious designs, which look, I'm a fan of and I'm not saying that's bad, but that does usually mean that those cars will start to age a lot faster and will have a lot more difficulty standing the test of time. And this sentiment about the Tesla Model 3 having this plain look is amplified like tenfold when you actually take a trip inside the vehicle. And that's because the Model 3 has got to be the most minimal interior on any vehicle period. It's really unlike anything I've ever seen. There's no gauge cluster, virtually no physical buttons, no traditional gear selector, just a massive tablet in the center of the car that has a striking resemblance to an iPad. Now, I decided to go with the black seats mainly because I do have a toddler, and even though everyone says washing the white seats are easy to do, I just couldn't risk it. That said, I think the black vegan leather looks great. It pairs especially nicely with this wood trim on the front for a very clean, refined look. You get a good amount of storage up front with the center console, dual wireless charging pads underneath the display, and probably my favorite part of the interior is the panoramic sunroof. And directly tied to that, one month later, one of my biggest takeaways from this car is how surprisingly comfortable it is from a space perspective. From the outside looking in, the Model 3 looks way smaller than it actually is. The glass roof and the lack of any real clutter anywhere actually makes this an open space where the vehicle feels noticeably airy and comfortable. And overall, one month later, I personally love the interior of the Model 3. I do realize it's one of the most polarizing components of the car itself, and to be honest, I did have initial reservations about it when the car was first announced, but I underestimated just how much I'd enjoy a super clean, clutter-free cabin that's really comfortable to be in. Much like how I described my thoughts on the exterior of the vehicle, I feel as though this simplistic approach to the Model 3's interior will stand the test of time. You do really have to give it a shot to understand what Tesla's trying to accomplish here with this ultra-minimalist approach, but believe me when I say they're being super intentional 
rational about it and it makes a lot of sense. Now, when talking Tesla, you can't not talk about quality as the manufacturer does have a bit of a spotty record when it comes to execution on their vehicles. Now, for me, when I was taking delivery of the Model 3, I did notice that the rear passenger door was not closing correctly. It definitely wasn't aligned right and the reps at Tesla told me to set a service appointment so I can get it fixed. I went in a few days later and they were able to resolve the matter without any issues. Aside from that, everything else with the fit and finish both on the inside and outside was totally fine. But it literally took me one drive, the drive home from the dealership to realize that Tesla doesn't do the best when it comes to paint jobs. The very next morning after taking the car home, I noticed this huge rock chip which literally made me want to cry. And you realize quick that the Model 3 with its low profile and virtually no front grille, it's an absolute magnet for rocks, bugs, and any other debris on the road. So in order to help preserve and protect this fragile paint job, mainly from future rock chips, I did decide to get paint protection film on the front of the vehicle. I got mine done at Umbra Window Tinting, which if you live anywhere remotely close to the Chicagoland area, they are the go-to team for window tinting, ceramic coating, and of course PPF. And dude, they let me hang out at their shop all day while they installed the film on my Model 3, and I was legit blown away. These guys were like surgeons going through the process. They spent so much time and effort just cleaning the paint first to make sure that it was free of any dirt and contaminants. It was actually super satisfying to watch. They then laser printed the Expel PPF using precise cutouts for the Model 3. The Expel PPF they use is great because it's super durable, completely invisible to match the exact same glossy finish as the regular paint job. And it can actually self heal with a little bit of heat in case you accidentally scuff it up. And when they were applying the film to the car, they went panel by panel, making sure that not even a speck of dust was in the way, tucking everything in for a seamless installation. The attention to detail was pretty incredible and I quickly realized that I would have never been able to have done this on my own. The team at Umbra was able to wrap the front bumper, the entire hood, the fenders, headlights, and the side mirrors. And dude, when it was done, I was shocked because it seriously looks like nothing is on there. You really can't see anything that would indicate it's been wrapped. And I think the biggest benefit of PPF is the peace of mind you get knowing that the most vulnerable parts of your car's paint are thoroughly protected without altering the look of your vehicle. The install also came with a 10 year warranty, so it's good to know that these jobs are meant to last. Big shout out again to Umbro Window Tinting. I'm gonna leave links to their website and their social handles in the description. If you're in the Chicagoland area and you're looking to get PPF, window tints, or ceramic coating done to your car, definitely hit them up. Their reviews are through the roof and after seeing them in action, I could totally understand why. Okay, next, let's talk about the functionality of the 2023 Tesla Model 3, what you get and don't get with this being the cheapest model, and what it's like from a user experience standpoint. So first, how's it like using the screen as the primary interface for virtually 99% of the car's functions? Honestly, it's pretty great, and I'm gonna tell you why. It's probably one of the most intuitive UIs I've ever experienced. Now, sure, I did have to block out around half an hour to just sit in the Model 3 and learn where everything was, but by the end of the short session, I had all my settings dialed in and the menus customized the way I like and felt as though I had a pretty good grip on how to access everything I needed while driving. I know Tesla gets a ton of criticism for designating even the small things like opening the glove box to the display. You really need to use the car to understand that nine times out of 10, those complaints are really non-issues either because the function in question rarely requires accessing once you've set it up or you can customize the interface to make whatever it is you need more accessible. For example, I have the front and back window defroster set on my dock because those are two things that I want quick access to while driving. I also use voice commands for things like opening up the glove box or using navigation. It works really well. And again, it's super intuitive and easy to get used to. Plus the integration of these two buttons on the steering wheel is so well done. I actually use these more often than the screen while driving. Now, when it comes to features, you get all the big heavy hitters that really makes a Tesla a Tesla. For example, you get the built-in navigation that will automatically bake in stops at superchargers based on your current charge level and destination. You get the full entertainment suite with the base Model 3, which includes access to YouTube, Netflix, TikTok, a ton of games, and other Tesla knickknacks, which is great. You also get Sentry Mode, which is basically like the ring doorbell system for your car. It's probably one of the most sophisticated security systems on any vehicle. Now, in terms of more standard car features, you do get heated seats in all the seats, which is great, as well as a heated steering wheel, which has been really clutch for me as winters in Chicago's can get pretty brutal. You also get the button activated doors, which are pretty fun, two USB-C ports in the back, and two more in the storage compartment up front. And of course, access to the Tesla app so you can use your phone as your key and have access to a multitude of controls remotely. You're also privy to all the safety features like the automatic blind spot camera that initiates when you use a turn signal, warning for potential collisions, drifting out of your lane, or forgetting that you left the door open. And of course, the most noteworthy Tesla feature, autopilot. Now, I did only opt for the standard autopilot, not the enhanced or full self-driving, which I feel are just not worth it. But having regular autopilot on this car is pretty great. And it's nice that even the cheapest model comes with such a robust feature. And it makes driving on the highway a lot easier to do. 
Now, full transparency, there are some notable omissions that are tied to the cheapest Tesla Model 3. Number one, the base model comes with the partial premium audio system, which means it's lacking an amplifier and subwoofer that comes with the full premium package. And look, the partial premium doesn't sound as good as the full premium, which really is an outstanding audio system, but I'd say it's still above average when compared to the competition. The sound is clear, it can get really loud, and you do have the ability to dial in the sound to a certain degree. And one month later, I never felt as though I was anywhere near having a subpar sound system. It's actually been quite enjoyable for me. The other more controversial omission is not something that's exclusive to the Model 3. In fact, all 2023 Teslas will no longer have this, and this of course are the ultrasonic sensors. Tesla made the decision to remove these sensors first from the 2023 Model 3s and Ys, and no lie, it kind of sucks. Ultrasonic sensors are the things that are usually in the front and back bumpers that lets you know how close you are to something like another car or a curb, which is really useful when parking your vehicle. And for Tesla, it was a critical component to the summon and park assist features that for the here and now are just turned off. Now, Tesla did say that the camera-based Tesla vision system will replace the need of these sensors, much like how it was when Tesla removed the radar systems from their older vehicles. The annoying part of this is that Tesla removed the sensors without Tesla vision being ready to replace its function. So all the new Model 3s and Ys for the here and now are completely absent of any parking assist features. Now, at the end of the day, it hasn't been the biggest deal because I park cars long enough without sensors to confidently ensure I'm not gonna run into anything with my Model 3 when doing so, but I don't like it when companies take away features with only the promise of a replacement coming in the near future, especially when that company is Tesla, who has a bit of a reputation for making big promises and has difficulty keeping. Full self-driving, I'm looking at you. But let's talk about what it's actually like to drive the cheapest Tesla Model 3, and I will disclose this is my first EV, so there were a lot of general wow moments, so I'll try and highlight the things that have stood out the most. First, it's important to note that as this is the rear-wheel drive variant of the Model 3, there's only a single electric motor powering the car, and as such, it does have quote-unquote the slowest acceleration speed. Now, right off the bat, I'm just gonna nip this in the bud to suggest in any way that this car is slow is a gross misinterpretation of what you're actually getting with this car. The base Model 3 is still incredibly incredibly quick and you definitely feel that as a driver. You still get access to that instant torque that makes EV so fun to drive and dude, it is powerful. You really feel yourself being squished into the seats when you let it rip and it's truly unlike anything I've ever experienced in any car. Now I'm a pretty conservative driver, so one month later I am glad I didn't go for something like the Performance Model 3. I can't even imagine how insane it must feel with that car 0-60, it must be a lot of fun. But as far as practicality, the base version will more than adequately be able to help you merge into a tight space or make that yellow light, and it's still super fun to drive. And that enjoyment to me is enhanced with the way the car handles. The Model 3 is designed in a way where it's pretty low to the ground and with most of its weight in the center of its frame. So steering on sport mode is responsive and though it's not at the level of a true sports car, it's something I'd describe as above average. Now the most jarring thing about driving the Tesla Model 3 for me was the regen braking, which again is more a reflection of me being a noob to EVs more than anything else. Again, I'm generally a pretty conservative driver who often coasts when driving gasoline powered vehicles, which made my first drive of the Model 3 really odd because Taking your foot completely off the accelerator on this car is basically equivalent to pressing on the brake pretty aggressively. So it took me a little bit of time to adjust the level of regen and how to properly come to a stop, but overall, it's been one of my favorite things about driving the Model 3. Now, some parts about the driving experience that might not be the best. Number one, let's talk about the Model 3 suspension. You get a pretty basic coil suspension with all the Model 3, so it's not exclusive to the base model, but pair that with how low the car is to the ground, as well as with the 19-inch wheels that I have, it can make for a bit of a rougher ride that some would like. Now, I mentally prepared myself for the worst based on some of the reviews I watched, but I'm happy to say it's really not that big of a deal for me. Unless you're driving regularly on pothole-laden roads, it's nothing I'd say is overtly bad in terms of ride quality, especially because when driving on good roads, the electric motor is so smooth it more than makes up for the few times it gets a bit bumpy in the car. Now, the other potential downside to driving a Model 3 is the road noise. This was another thing I had braced myself for as so much of the car is made out of glass and Tesla has had issues with soundproofing in the past. One month later, I'm happy to say that my fears here were overblown. Yes, you do hear more of the road noise from the tires, especially when at higher speeds, but that's mainly because there's literally no engine noise or other cabin noise, so it tends to exacerbate the noise from the outside. It's definitely not something I'd say is overly problematic, and frankly, I don't even notice it when I'm listening to music at my normal volume levels. And that brings me to the last, and depending on who you are, potentially the most important aspect about driving the base Model 3, and that's its range. So no doubt one of the biggest thing that distinguishes the cheapest Tesla is its range, as 
it has an EPA estimate of 272 miles, which for me is actually lower because of my upgraded 19 inch sport wheels. Now, prior to taking the plunge, range anxiety was one of my biggest concerns that was holding me back. But what I can say confidently one month later, this was my biggest overblown fear. Here's the thing, range anxiety I now realize is a complex byproduct of multiple variables. And being fixated exclusively on the vehicle's EPA estimated range is very incomplete and I'll explain why. First of all, the average consumer based on US data drives around 40 miles a day. And even if you were to double that to say 80 miles a day, which is a pretty generous stretch, on a full charge, you'll have more than enough to comfortably get to wherever you need to get to without any issues. What's far more a factor connected to what drives range anxiety is what sort of charging solution you'll have access to? For example, if you're like me and you have a home garage where you could charge every day and you're driving the normal amount, range anxiety on this car is basically a non-issue. I just had a NEMA 1450 outlet installed and it's more than fast enough to get me to my desired range every morning. It's pretty freaking great. Now, if in the event that you don't have access to a garage, let's just say, for example, you park on the street or you just don't have access to a charger regularly and you have to rely on public chargers, that's much more of a primary driver of range anxiety in my opinion. It doesn't matter if your car can go 500 miles, if you can only charge at public chargers, I don't think a slightly larger range will eliminate your concerns. Now, the good thing is, as a Tesla owner, even if you are in that scenario, you do get access to by far the most robust public charging network. Not only are superchargers easy to find, they're the most integrated from a user experience standpoint, as the car software makes the process of finding and using a supercharger as easy as humanly possible. Plus, of particular note with the base Model 3, it is equipped with Tesla's LFP battery pack, which Tesla claims could be charged regularly to 100% for maximum range coverage without accelerating degradation. There's quite a sporty debate online on whether or not you should actually do that. I personally charge around 80% every day, minus one day where I will juice it up to 100. If anyone watching has the LFP battery pack, let me know in the comments what you do when it comes to charging. I'm seriously confused on what really is the best practice here. So overall, I gotta say, I really love my 2023 base Tesla Model 3. I really don't have any initial regrets about not going with the long range or performance variant or not going with the Model Y. I'm very happy with the cheapest Tesla, and I think it's pretty incredible value for all you're getting with this car. Like, I feel like I'm getting 95% of the user experience tied to any of those more expensive models at a significantly lower price. Factor in the $7,500 tax credit that I am eligible for as I took delivery prior to March, and the base Model 3 is a pretty outstanding deal. Now, does Tesla have to work on things like quality control and feature maintenance? Yes, without question. But to be fair, I haven't had any major heartburn with this car yet, and I've been having a lot of fun with it, I'm not gonna lie. But hey, I recognize it's a Tesla Tesla, quite possibly the most polarizing brand in the world today. So let me know what you guys think. Do you think the cheapest Model 3 is worth it? Or do you think it's a big mistake? Curious to get your thoughts. Let me know what you guys are thinking in the comments down below. Now, if you're interested in learning more about the Tesla buying process and the whole EV tax credit thing, check out these videos here. They're going to help you be as informed as possible.